last class we talked about what? Who can tell me? In Portuguese or English? Go ahead. What was the subject of the last class? Neo4j. So we showed a practical application of uh, uh, graph databases, right? And also a cipher query, query language. So we showed, we saw how to query things, okay? I will not go deep in the things because the, the, the goal of this discipline is not to teach you details of each of these languages, but only show a kind of overview of everything, okay? So at the end you can have a kind of scenario uh, we are uh, inserted. So today I will do the following. We start what we, I call um, a draft of ontologies, okay? And what is a draft of ontologies? The idea is uh, uh, I want to depart of the idea of graphs and show you uh, how people think in knowledge formalization and so on and so forth. The basic principle here is think about um, what is the difference between having just graphs and having an ontology, okay? Which can be expressed as a graph, but is not necessarily a graph. Okay, so we will start today in the same point we started in the last class. Okay, we we'll start with some description of a lizard. Okay, now it's not a dinosaur. Okay, okay, sorry, but uh, I, I didn't prepare dinosaurs for today, but Okay, uh, and uh, this lizard has name, description, origin, and so on and so forth. And we saw in the last classes that we could ex uh, represent it in XML, right? So XML has this uh, concept of hierarchy, and we can share documents in XML, and so on, right? And uh, I'm just reviewing things. I showed in the in the when I talked about XML, I showed you the problem of the, the, we can express the same thing in several ways, right? So the same uh, description can have different schemas. Do you remember that? I asked you to to draw a kind of representation in XML. And each one of the students has a different concept of how could be an schema. So XML has this problem of I cannot have a standard representation of some, uh, a standard approach to produce descriptions. And also uh, it's, it's a kind of standards in the syntactical way. But machines, for example, here is uh, if you remember, is an interesting uh, article, and you could look on it at the Nature. It was published on Nature, and it shows that, for example, we have two uh, XML representation for the same um, the same thing we want to study. Okay, which is something related to pro uh, I don't know, it's a protein or something, but it's something I'm trying to study. Right, and then uh, the the thing is, we have two formats, and since we just have an schema, it's not possible, for example, to know that these two fields here, these two fields here, for example, means coordinates, okay, and these two fields here, for example, means diameter, so. How can I, in some sense, express that? Telling that this is an kind of ellipse, and this is a point, and this is the position of the point. So, in some sense, what we are looking for is 
I want that machines read and interpret this representation. This is the challenge, okay? And <coughs> but it's not a simple task. Do you want to ask something? Okay, so the question is if each area has its own schema, if this is good or bad. Um, in my uh, in my personal interpretation, we we have uh, we are going in ages, ages of maturity in information sharing. Okay, so in the first age, we don't have a uh, so wide spread syntactical standard so we don't have a syntactical standard that everybody uses okay we don't have it right so uh, <coughs> we have a uh, several problems and challenges in information exchange reuse and several works trying to do that and this and that and proposals and so on and so forth okay <coughs> so uh, in my point of view, XML it was one of the most successful approaches to define a syntactical standard. So everybody is really, really excited with this opportunity and telling, okay, now we can exchange everything. Okay, so in, since XML started, everybody went uh, start a kind of run towards let's produce standards. Okay, so <coughs> people of several areas are starting doing that, producing a standard for this, for that, and so on and so forth. Since it's easy, you can just sit with a committee or even you and start drawing a schema, and that's it. Okay, so it's so easy that then it. It fostered several standards. And it was good because many people could exchange information. So, for example, <coughs> we can tell about the biodiversity standards. The, the biodiversity standards I show you do, okay, of GBIF and so on. So, what they do, they can have some kind of classification of living beings, okay? And <coughs> They have XML standards and they share information across the world. So this is really good. You, you, for example, last uh, in the in the beginning of the year, I participated in a workshop in France. People showing how many things you can do if you have access to information of biodiversity in the entire world. Okay, what happens there? People want more. Okay, so when you achieve at this point, you tell, okay, this is, we already achieved at this point, we want more. Okay, so, and what is more? Since you, you achieve at this point, you figure out that now you have billions of information in a standard way. Okay, so in the past, you cannot integrate. Now you can integrate in a synthetic level. But now you, are, you have what we call a data deluge. It's a huge volume of data. And the problem is, <coughs> what is happening with the standards? They are becoming more and more specialized. Because people want more and more and more. So people want, okay, I now want to know what's the color of the living being, what's the size, what's the... Blah, 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 blah. And so the standards become bigger and bigger and bigger. But... Since they are designed for human interpretation, the schema, not the data, okay? Even, even if machines can read, they cannot interpret these, thing, these basic things. They cannot know that these two fields are coordinates. They cannot know that. Since it's just for humans, humans must read all the specification to produce the application that consumes this data. But the standards are becoming more and more complex. So if you want to produce something in the geographic standards, they have kind of uh, 
specifications with thousands of pages and you must read them to produce an application. So it's becoming harder and harder to have people to follow all of these standards to implement applications to handle them. So what we are what is the thing now? We are achieving we are achieving the frontier in which we have benefits of the syntactical interoperability with XML and so on, but we need more. This is, exa this is exactly the point. XML was not designed it was not designed to combine schemas. It was not designed to do that. It's possible but it's hard. Okay, so what happens? Each standard when it evolves, it starts to map everything again. <laughs> okay? So if you go, for example, one standard I like is the, for example, if you get geo, geographic, uh, geographic standards, okay? So what they do? They define everything again. So you go to biological standards, they define everything again, medical again. And only in the medical context, if you enter in, you just, if you enter, for example, in, in the bioontology portal, Okay, just to have an idea, you cannot imagine sometimes I think, wow, we have a lot of people living in this world, right? And a lot of researchers, because when I think these things, I think how it's possible to have so many things. So, for example, this is uh, a portal for ontologies. It's not XML schemas, okay? But just to give you an idea of how many standards we have just in biology. Just in biology. I'm not telling about, okay? And this is ontologies, okay? This is already the next step. If, if you are talking about the previous, which are XML schemas, is much more than that. Ontology library. So they list here, let me see if I can show you, because now they changed the things. Let me see in the bio portal they show that. Because they show you the list, and it's a huge list. And we are talking about just biology, okay? So, and this is our onto these are ontologies, okay? If, so you see here, you see here, not, it's not that ontology, views, no med, no, no. They change it. Browse ontology, it's probably is here. Oh, let me see if they show here. So, the thing is, the others become more, so then if you just take a look here, you see just in biology, just in biology. <laughs> This is, each one of these things is an ontology, okay? Got, now, you may imagine if these guys are producing XML schemas, what will happen becomes impossible. No human being can handle this complexity. It's not possible, okay? So what happens now? What, which point we achieve it? We achieve the point which is the following. It's like you have a friend. And this friend, the name of this friend is machine. Now you must explain to this friend how to read these things so it can help you. Okay? So, the thing is, please, can, it's like talking to a machine, can you help me to read this bunch of things and process it? And the machine tells me, okay, I can read it, but you must write it in such a way that I can interpret. This is the challenge, okay? And is one of the hardest challenges we are facing now. It's not simple. And I will show you just the beginning of the idea. Okay.
And the idea of semantic web is exactly that. What's the idea of semantic web? We need a language to so this picture is the is exactly the thing. Machines talking by themselves. Okay? So is in the thing is what we want we want that machines they talk by themselves and they do the tasks for us. Okay? So uh, uh, an interesting idea is the following. Uh, I don't know if you know this project of intelligent cars. You know that? You see Google are putting money on that? Okay. So it drives by itself. Right? You see that? Did you see? The intelligent car? It, it drives by itself. Then people ask, first, how can I guarantee that safe? Okay, so let's imagine the future. How I can guarantee this car will not do some kind of mistake and kill me? Right? Okay, so the thing is, they are trying to prove that with the sensors and everything, it can be even better than a human being. But the most important thing people tell is, you may imagine in the future when all cars are intelligent, okay? They can talk by themselves by a by a network of wireless network, and then your car will discover where are the the g traffic jams, and just get another route. So the cars you organize that by themselves in a such a way that you can, in some cases, never have a traffic jam. Because they are organized by themselves, okay? So, for example, you can call use your car. Can we leave now? And your car tell, no, not now, because now it's too too much traffic. So your car can tell you, no, no, later. <laughs> and then afterwards, you call your car, call you, <laughs> ring your phone. You get your phone. Okay, here is your car talking to you. Can we go now? Because it's a good time to go. So how how the car will do that? They you talk by themselves. And the basic idea here is the same. Okay? For example, you can ask your machine, buy a computer for me. And that's it. So your machine has data for what kind of work you do. Okay? It knows uh, your credit cards. You know how much money you have in your account. It knows... You can go on the web and look on the data and see what's the best option. It can participate with other machines in a kind of uh, pregão. I don't know how to tell in English, but it's a kind of leilão. Okay? So, it can do everything in an automatic way. But to do that, they must have a way to talk by themselves. Okay. So, uh, I already showed this stack. Okay? We studied the first in black and the second in green or in red. Now we talk about the third, which is RDF. We started to talk about what people are looking in RDF. So to go towards RDF, we will transform our description in a graph. Okay? It becomes a graph. But we have a discipline here. It's not like Okay, you can do the graph as you want. No, it's not there. You cannot do the graph as you want. We have a straight discipline. Okay? This is Sparta. It's not uh, the thing you did anymore. Right? So now, is, there is just one way to do the thing. Just one way. There is no two or three ways to do the things. So, what will you do? We will get our description. And we will break... The description in things we call properties and values. Okay? We have something we describe, which we call resource. And we have properties and values. Properties and values, properties and values. So this is the basic model. And the interesting thing in RDF is, is only that. is one of the simplest models to describe knowledge. Okay? They design the kind of uh, machine language for semantics. So this is the idea. And what happens is 
it becomes a graph okay in which you have resource which is a node of the graph property which is an edge of the graph and value which is another node of the graph okay so this is the way and the only way to do descriptions in RDF and that's it so in this case our lizard will be lizard name that the description that origin that we, we saw a bit of that in the previous uh, class when I talked about graph model right did you remember that okay but here we will go further now okay and what happens when our descriptions are more complex we have a lot of things levels and interconnected things so uh, uh, our our graph will become much more uh, detailed okay uh, let's imagine that our um, our XML starts becoming a graph okay so we start defining for example that we have the description the resource and we have the property okay but then your value can be another resource in the sense that your value is something more complex than just a node okay so you have a node which is your value and then this node now will be described so it becomes again a resource which has a property which has a value and so on and so forth but so this is just um, the way we want to do things so the idea is we want to express everything as a graph okay but here we have a problem graph we are read saw graphs right in the last two classes so okay what's the what's the novelty in the graph where, where is this kind of semantics or this kind of how you talk that machines can talk by themselves okay so this is still here is like an XML thing right it's not nothing is new here yet okay but then we start for small steps and the first step is what we call a controlled vocabulary okay and what is a controlled vocabulary okay the thing is machines are not so good to interpret uh, to interpret context and to interpret uh, subjective information as we do okay so is not a good idea to give free text to machines okay then you can tell me oh andre but i am working in a kind of uh, machine that can read texts and so on and so forth and and we have machine learning and the science is developing and i will tell you this is not the goal of semantic web it's not the goal okay so we are not producing intelligent machines no we are not producing intelligent machines we are not producing machines able to read free text. This is not the goal. The goal is the following. We want to change the way we express information in such a way that machine can read and interpret. Right? So, the first thing is, we must agree in a vocabulary. When you use a term, when you use something, this thing must be precise right so to have a controlled vocabulary the, the 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 word control means control in some place you define the words you can use and you use these words you control because these words has a specific meaning and then becomes the uri 
So the basic idea in RDF is the following. If I want to control, okay, so we want to control something, okay. There is some, some basic and important things when you want to control a vocabulary. The first thing is, whenever I create a new word in this vocabulary, okay, this new word must be unique in the existing word, right? Because I'm, cre I'm now creating it. I'm creating the new word. And I'm, in some sense, giving some semantics to the new word. Okay? Okay. But I must have an, uh, a way to guarantee that it's unique. That nobody you use the same word to do something else. Right? So, the idea of using URI is really important because as and I advise you everybody to read this paper of Tim Bernthal because it's really really a good paper it changed the way you see the semantic web okay it's really well written and in this paper it shows that you see as RDF use URIs to encode information in a document the URIs ensure that concepts are not just words in a document but are tied to a unique definition that everywhere can find on the web that everyone can find on the web so the thing is one of the most important examples I will show further is the Dublin Core Dublin Core started with RDF and they defined 15 terms Okay? and 15 URIs and the first first time I saw that I thought, I, I thought this is a big deal I mean this guy seated and defined 15 words and then why people are so happy with that but the words are 15 terms highly used to describe things which is mainly resource right Title, <laughs> everything has a title. Uh, creator, okay. Date, it was created, and this is so 15. And then what happens? Everybody who use, wants to describe something that uses title, it uses the URI of title of Dublin Core. So you may imagine, I am a machine. I'm a machine, and I, I arrive here, in this place, I I'm see a description. I never saw the description before. I don't know what's here. I never saw that. I don't know the schema. I don't know nothing. I'm just reading it. Okay. Then, I go there and see an URI title. I know this thing. Because this is the Dublin Core title. So I can know this is the title. Just that, because I have a controlled vocabulary with a specific semantics. Okay? Did you understand? So, what happens now? Imagine that the thing I want to describe must have an URI. Okay? So, if I want to describe this lizard here, it has an URI, okay? To avoid big URIs, I'm using namespaces, okay? So, this is, I'm using namespace there, but this is a URI of the lizard, right? Okay. And... So, for example, this URI, which is the cor uh, corresponds to this specific lizard, has some uh, graphics or some descriptors. I'm using namespaces, okay, just to remember. I don't, you remember namespaces, right? You remember that? So, it's a kind of find really place. If I define these namespaces, they call that. Where you use that, you can see that and so on. 
<coughs> so what happens then? Each element of my graph, each node of my graph, which is not literal, I I will talk later what's not literal, becomes uh, a node defined by an URI. Okay, so you may imagine the following. Uh, this is my lizard here. Okay, let me use a green for example. This is my lizard. And uh, this lizard, I want to, to know where it lives. Okay. And for example, I want to define it lives, it's found in Asia. Okay. So, the, the concept that represents Asia is an URI okay and also it's found in I don't know Australia another URI so what happens is I start to give URIs to identify each concept in my graph okay uh, Okay, so let me see what happens here. Oh no, this is the property. Okay. So yeah, this this is not a good. This is not well good. But let's let's imagine the following. I will produce another slide better than that by hand. So, I have a node here, which is my lizard. Let me draw the lizard here. It seems a lizard? No. Right. Okay. I'm not a good drawer. Okay. So, okay. So, this lizard has a new eye. Okay, HTTP blah 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 blah. Okay, so it's there is an address on the web you which is unique only for this lizard. Every time I want to talk about this lizard, I use this URI. And then I want to tell that this lizard, uh, the origin of this lizard is. Asia, or it lives in Asia, for example. For example, lives in Asia. So I will have a node here, but instead of creating right here Asia, this also has an URI. Blah blah blah, which is the URI of Asia. In the, you can have even Asia here in the where I doesn't matter, okay? So good, I have an URI to define lizard and URI to define Asia, okay? Are you following me? So I have two points on my graph. One point means lizard, Varanus, blah blah blah. The second point means Asia, and I connect them by leaves or origin but I will use origin which is better so did you understand the role of uh, URI here and why it's controlled it's controlled because for example in my system Every time I want to tell something refers to Asia, it will point to the same URI. So, everything whose origin is in Asia, everything who is starts a flight who starts in Asia, everything in my knowledge base referring to Asia will point to the same URI. 
which means the same node in my graph. So there is one only one node meaning AC. And that's it. Okay. But we still have a problem here, which is the property. The problem is the property is not controlled, right? It's just a word, origin, right? It's not a controlled vocabulary, right? But in fact, in RDF, it is. So, how we do that? Imagine, imagine the following graph. Imagine the following graph. Imagine that I want to tell that this lizard lives in Asia. Okay? So this is lives in Asia. But the connection is the origin. Origin of the lizard. Okay? But origin itself is also a concept. Okay? So, in some sense, I want to tell that this guy here is the origin described by this guy here. In some sense, it's like this is the property, origin, and this is the value, Asia, right? But this is not so light resource property value. You tell me, Andre, this is really a bad way to do things, right? And this is not the RDF to do things. The RDF way is the following. I will show you that I can define something like origin as a property. Okay? When I define this thing as a property, it receives an URI. Okay? So it has an URI which is origin. And then I can use the URI in the graph. Okay? So here what happens is you see origin here. What happens? There is a kind of parallel graph. Okay. In a parallel world, who saw fringe? You know fringe? The seriado. I don't know how to spell seriado in English. Okay. Fringe. You know fringe? Did you see fringe? It's good. Fringe. No? No? Never saw fringe? You saw fringe? I'll tell you just the best episode of fringe. So, you run to, list to see it. The best episode is the following. A guy is in a plane. Okay? A guy is in a plane. And then it starts to bleed the node, nose. And the guy looks and tells, Oh my God. And then come, goes to the back of the plane and tell the people, tell the, the, Aeromos, I don't know how to tell, but tell to the Aeromos. What is the strongest sedation you have in this plane? <laughs> and, uh, and then the Aeromos tells, calm down guy, calm down, everything is fine. And the guy tells, you didn't understand. What is the strongest thing you have to sedate some, someone? What's happened to you, guy? Calm down. You don't understand. Please, go to these people and ask everybody if they have sedates here. Put everything together and give to me. What's happening to you? 
the guy who tells, if something has happened to you, okay, you didn't understand. So I'll tell you what's happened. I will enter in that bathroom. And you, you listen a lot of noise. And no matter what you listen, no matter what happens, don't open the door. <laughs> it's good, right? This is good, right? So the guy enters in the, in the bathroom. It's not the pilot. No, it's not the pilot. No, it's, it's a passenger. It's not the pilot. No, no, it's one passenger. It's one passenger. That's sitting in there and... and because uh, and then it enters in the bathroom, and I will not tell you the the, the rest of the chapter because you must see. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> but why I'm telling about fringe? Because fringe has two words, okay, two parallel words, and one word uh, influences the other word. And RDF is the same; has two words, are two graphs, okay. One graph, so they are two simple graphs, but one graph define how the other graph behaves. Beautiful, right? Okay, so <laughs> it's a kind of meta graph. So, for example, this graph here, my letter is good, right? You can read that it's origin here, something like that, okay? So, let, let me improve. This is origin. So this is a kind of another graph. And origin, I will show you further, is type property. RDF property. So what happens here is, this URI, this is specific URI, becomes a property. So in the parallel world, okay, in the parallel world, you use it as a property using the URI. So it's controlled. Okay? It's controlled. Did you understand? So the node tells to the edge, I will enter in that bathroom. <laughs> and no matter what happens, <laughs> Don't open the door. Okay. Right. Directed graph. Yeah. Uh, it's a good question. Did you understand? So, since it's a directed graph, okay, uh, I'm telling that uh, the, the lizard, the origin of the lizard is Asia, right? And it affects the implementation level, because in the implementation level, I produce a pointer from uh, lizard to the Asia, and not the opposite, right? And to answer your question, there are two ways to answer it, okay? The first one is the conceptual thing. So in the conceptual level, it doesn't matter, right? Because since I know that Bengalese is his origin is Asia, if I want to know who are the guys whose destination is Asia, I can do that in some sense. I can infer that. Okay, but doesn't matter. In the conceptual level. In the practical level, when we implement it, okay, it depends. The thing is, uh, the 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 search the request could be expensive if you don't do indexation okay so what happens is for example since the properties has a controlled vocabulary okay you can produce indexes for example for each type of uh, Varying each type of the property, for example, if you want. Okay? So it could be fa can be fast to do your request. Because when you tell, tell me what, which are the, the, the lizards 
uh, which whose origin is Asia. Okay, I can go quickly and find all the properties whose value is Asia and look for the 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 owner or the the, the resource, for example. So this is this is a matter of uh, how do you implement the thing, right? But but sometimes people produce kind of uh, uh, solutions to improve the the efficiency, like they produce the opposite. So they produce an edge telling exactly the opposite. Okay. So for example, you tell okay. So if the origin is Asia, okay. So Asia has, for example, Bengalese, but. In fact, the opposite, you can infer. You don't need to store it. You can infer it. But people could store it for uh, performance uh, issues. Okay? The trade-off here is storage versus processing. Okay? So, if you store, will be quicker, right? Uh, just go and get the destination, right? Otherwise, it, 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 this is a big discussion. Probably this discussion is interesting in the graph databases now. Because exactly in the graph databases, okay? Uh, for example, depends on how you store the graph. How do you start a graph? Depends. Okay. You may imagine that a graph could be an edge and all the uh, and, and a vertex and all the edges. For example, list of all the edges. Okay. But then I can imagine that I can produce what you call inverted lists. Okay. Uh, which is for each controlled word I want, I have uh, the pointer to all all guys in the graph, but this index, which is an inverted list, in some sense behaves like part of the graph since it has edges. Did you understand? Is I'm going down to the implementation things that we will not discuss here, but uh, this is a lot of discussion in the graph databases context. It's an interesting thing to discuss. Okay, because now people are discussing exactly that: how to 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 provide faster ways to do things. Yes, and this is exactly what we do here. So here, I show you that I'm using a graph to describe the property origin. Okay, and I show you just part of the graph. I can have several other things describing the property graph. So I use the same graph model to describe the property itself. Do you understand? So let's consider questions like which animals live in Asia, in Asia, or how to share a, uh, a, cat a variable, categorical character among the, among bases. So let's say which animals live in Asia. It's we, we can answer this question for two reasons. Okay? First, because it's just Asia has just one vertex. This is the idea. Okay? I have just one vertex for Asia. So I know that 
which animals live in, in Asia are all edges which points to Asia with some kind of uh, with the origin edge okay but so Asia is an URI and also origin is an URI so I know which property I'm looking for to answer your question and this property is standard because it's a controlled vocabulary for any living being that points to Asia. Okay? Are you following me? I'm going uh, step by step towards formalization. So there is linked data. I, I think I talked to you about linked data a bit, not so deep. But linked data is the first step to understand an ontology. Even though linked data doesn't require ontologies, doesn't require ADF, is not mandatory. Okay? So, what's the idea of linked data? I told you in the beginning, when I talked a bit about linked data, I told you the following. When Tim Berners-Lee designed the web, and it writes it in a paper about linked data, when he designed the web, we are thinking much more than just navigational links between things. He thinks that links between two things have some meaning. Right? So, now, the linked data is, let us go and try to connect information. Okay, so let's link. And link is knowledge. Okay, so it defines the steps to achieve the linked data. The first step, you want to be part of linked data? Okay, first step. Or one star. Uh, your data must be on the web. Okay, must be on the web in any format you want. I will not discuss the format with you. But the license must be open. In the sense that I'm, I, it's important to have access to your content. Okay? Okay. Second, if you want to improve more, okay, uh, the, the, the structure of the content must be machine readable. So it gives an example, an Excel instead of image scan of a table. So, okay? So if you put a scan of a table, the machines cannot read and interpret it yet. They are improving, but not yet not 100%. So if you put an Excel or some kind of spreadsheets, much better, because machines can read it without needing to interpret the image and so on. The third step is using a non-proprietary format. So, for example, if you use CSV instead of Excel, it's easier to access the information. So, you see, until the star tree, we don't, we are not talking about ontologies, nothing there. Just open your data. And then, four stars. All the above plus Use open standards from W3C to identify things so that people can point it at your stuff. What is standard W3C to identify? Give your eyes to your identification. Okay? So if someone tells me, Andre, now I want to get the, for example, the knowledge produced in this university and I want to share this knowledge in a linked data way. Okay? So then I will tell people, okay, to do that, first you must get the, the identification of each thing you want to share. For example, the identification of each uh, thesis, each technical report, each thing produced in the university, each thing, okay? So each 
um, news on the on the internal paper, everything, and give an URI to each part or each piece of information you want to share. Okay, so this thesis has an URI. This student has an URI. This professor has an URI. This whatever you want has an URI. So this is a step. And why this is important? This is important because when you do that, it's addressable. Other, other stuff can address your resources. Okay? So is the, the, the similar way is like uh, Twitter. But Twitter is much more free. Right? But what happens in Twitter? If you have your ID, you have, right? If you are in Twitter, you have an ID, which is the at symbol plus your ID, right? Or you can have a subject, which is the hashtag symbol plus something, right? So you may imagine like this thing is a kind of URI. And everybody wants to link their information, their news or with this guy. They just put inside the hashtag or the ad and it automatically points to it. So if you get all resources of you want to share, everything, and you identify each piece of information in a where I, people can link their information to your information. So this is huge. Okay, and then the opposite, the, the last is the opposite, and also link your data to other people's data. Okay, so the thing is, okay, let's consider that I have this thesis database here. Okay, and now each thesis is uh, identified by an URI. And I want now to tell which city was the home city of the author. Okay? Instead of put a string, I can put an URI for the city. But instead of creating my URIs for cities, I go to Debepedia and I get the URIs of the cities in the Debepedia. Okay? And then I use in my database to identify cities the URIs of the Wikipedia. So I not just offer links, offer URIs so people can link, but I link with other guys. Okay? I am forced to produce a network of knowledge. So just if people just do an effort to do that, if every researcher, if every content producer do a re uh, an effort to do that, you may imagine the things I can request to this database. For example, if I can request what is the production uh, of uh, Unicamp for, from people born in the hometown, I don't know, in some city, right? In Campinas or in Salvador. So you put the hometown, but when you put the hometown, you put the URI, okay? So I can get all information and I can give you the answer, right? And I can link everything. So people uh, link a data. People confuse semantic web and link a data. And I can tell you, the, my point of view, the difference is linked data is just the first step towards semantic web. The things I showed you until now, except the property, the property thing, except it, the other things I showed you is shared between linked data and semantic web. So linked data is the basis of semantic web. But, okay, but what more we can do? What more than that? Okay, let's go further. But before we go further, let just sh let me just show you what you 
what is the advantage of linking your knowledge with other people's knowledge. So, for example, there is this GeoNames, which is a huge database containing uh, places on the world. And so, let's let's see let's see it. Okay, so you get an idea. It's the best way to do the thing. GeoNames. This is this is a lot of fun. In this in this weekend you can play with geonames. Okay, so now I'll type here. Tell me a city. Lack of creativity. Itabuna. Itabuna is the city of Lucas. Let's see if Itabuna is in jail names. Oh, Itabuna is in jail names. Oh, you see? If Itabuna is in jail names, how many... Uh, Habitants, habit, habitants, I don't know how to tell. How many? 300,000. No, 300,000. 300,000 is, is not, right? 3,000 is like it. <laughs> uh, 300,000. So, yeah, so I click it here and it shows me. Uh, Information where is it, Abuna? Okay, so now Lucas can see his hometown. Okay, don't start to cry. Oh, I miss my. And then, but you tell me, okay, but this is for humans, right? So you get geotree. So let's see geotree. The first thing you see is that Itabuna has an URI okay and which uh, URI I'm talking about do you see that uh, number there so that number there here let me see here No, it's not. In fact, too much human, right? Right. I need something less for humans, more for machines. So Itabuna. Okay. So when when I click over Itabuna, Let me get here. Not tags. Hierarchy. You see that if I ask hierarchy, yes, the problem is this interface is not prepared for so small screen. So you see that Itabuna is inside Bahia, which is inside Brazil. Right, which is a country, right? But let me see where is the so ID. Okay, you see this this number there. Lucas knows this number by memory, right? You know this number by memory. Six three two zero eight eight four is your city. So, what happens in geo names? Uh, Whenever you put the name plus the ID, so you see the number here? So the URI, the URI of Itabona is this one without the geotree. So let me show you. Just that. 
and you go to Itabuna. This is the URI of Itabuna. Okay? So, any person who wants to describe Itabuna, instead of writing Itabuna, it puts the URI. Okay? And that's it. Yeah, this is a good question. The thing is, who has who has the power, <laughs> right, to define things, right? Because I'm telling you, okay, there is one, just one example. The thing is, in the in the semantic web, the project is something organic. Okay, what I mean by organic. They don't have uh, a mechanism to enforce who define the standard or who define the thing. But uh, the institutions start to impose themselves. So they gain visibility. And as much as people start to use their vocabulary, they become more and more important, more and more central. So, for example, your names is like that. Today, if you go to the, the works in ontologies, whenever they want to address a place, they put the URI of your names. And that's it. So, it, it, uh, it, uh, it uh, helps to always improve the thing, right? Because they have a hard system here, for example. Okay, I want to know uh, where is exactly Itabuna. Okay, so you have in a graph of information, you have all information you need. You have the hierarchy of space, so you know in the organization inside of which is Itabuna and so on and so forth. You have, for example, a polygon around the area the area in the map but this polygon is described in a semantic web way also so machines can read the polygon also they you know this is a polygon they know this polygon draws on the map okay so uh, the advantage of linking my information to our to geonames is when I do that and this is the thing when I link my information to geonames, for example, suppose I want to link this guy, but I link it in geonames. All the information concern space, geographic things, everything is now available to my knowledge base. Because now I can do inferences using these things. Yeah. In fact, uh, there are several works concerning uh, ontologies looking on this problem. And a, a similar problem is also versions. Sometimes they change because they improve the ontology. Okay? So, for example, this one, NASA Suite, okay, which is a, a big ontology created by NASA. It's huge. To describe all natural resources on the Earth. So you may imagine that the first version they deployed has several things they want to fix in the future. And for example, this version is the version 2. It's not the version 1. And what happens is people that link their things to the version 1, right, is the same problem because you tell me, okay, several people link the information to geonames. What happens if in the future someone becomes more used than geonames? For example, Google deploys something much better and people start to use the Google thing and what happens? Okay, so in this case, we have what we call mapping. Okay, since it's a graph, I can get nodes in this graph and 
I can tell this is equivalent to that, for example. Okay? This is equivalent to that, this is equivalent to that, and so on and so forth. And in the in the web now we have a service. Okay? Uh, because in RDF I will show you in OWL, okay? We have uh, uh, a directive you can use in your edge. We call same as, okay? So same as is whenever you want to tell that something is same as of something else, and someone had the idea of creating a service, a same as service. So what is this service? The service is the following. You give two URIs, which are two nodes, okay? And tell to this service, this is same as that, okay? So, it produces a kind of edge, right? Same as, this is same as of that. So what happens is, if you are looking to something equivalent, you get what you have. You go there and you ask the service, what is same as of that? And the service gives you everything which is in the database like same as of what you got. So you can do the connections. But you can also have more controlled connections. You can get and map two things with this thing. Okay? Exactly that. I will show you that the basis of ontologies in the way we define a semantic web is what we call, call open world assumption, assumption. Okay? And the open world assumption is the opposite of the closed world assumption, which is the database. So when you have, for example, a relational database, you can define what is right and what is wrong in your schema, in your directives, everything else. Okay, so you, you, you control your universe. Okay? And what happens here is you don't have the control of the universe and you can never have if you want to link things. And the problem is you produce contradictory things. Okay? You can produce contradictory things, you can produce uh, wrong information. So, well, for example, someone can go here and put the same as of something which is not same as. Okay? And then, how you define the quality? How you define if you can trust? And then, people start to do research of, okay, the open world assumption is the basis of the model. We cannot do it in another way. It's not possible. Okay? But then, we must improve our mechanisms to guarantee the provenance, you, if you can trust on it, if you have conflicting things, how you handle the conflicts, how you solve the thing, okay? And another thing is, uh, uh, the machine must be able to explain you why it did such a decision. And this is highly important. Because you may imagine the scenario when you ask, buy me a machine, okay? And then when you come back to home, the machine is different of what you are considering. For example, the color is green. <laughs> and you don't like green notebooks, you want a black notebook, okay? And why this stupid machine bought me a green notebook, right? So then, I, wa I ask the machine, explain to me <laughs> how you achieved the conclusion that I want a green machine. Right? And the machine must be able to explain you why. And this is important to do, to, to, to audit your conclusions, which is another way to guarantee some trust. You must be able to audit, right? But 
we are always the open word assumption stays. So, so well, about this question, someone asked it one time. I think it was for Tim Berners Lee. But if I cannot have 100% of trust in the information, will it be useful? Okay? And the answer is, when you type something in Google and it gives you something, okay, it's not based in 100% of what you want, right? But it is still useful. Okay? So, uh, the, the idea is like that. Is working on algorithms and things that work on this scenario of open world assumption. Okay? So, um, but then, how a graph becomes something else? How a graph becomes something more than a graph? Okay? And to understand that, we must start to introduce the notion of ontology. Okay? We are still we are still starting the idea. Uh, further, we will go deep on it. But now we will start the idea. But the the idea of ontology in computer science started with a famous paper of Gruber in '93. Okay, this is so famous that today most of the papers in ontology cite this definition. So Gruber uh, introduced the term ontology in the computer science context, okay? Because the term ontology is used in other contexts, okay? But in a different meaning, is not exactly the same meaning of computer science. So, uh, Gruber got this name and used it to define the following. An ontology is an explicit specification of a conceptualization. <laughs> this is so generic <laughs> that everything fits. <laughs> no, not everything, but a lot of things. So this, is, this but the idea of having something that can be read would a specification is explicit it was important and, and if you read all the paper it explains you what is explicit for example said okay but then another paper in 97 tried to improve this concept telling that uh, uh, the, the specification must be formal and share it and the conceptualization is shared by a community. By formal, it means that machines must be able to read and interpret. And then, um, someone proposed that, put the things together. So, ontology is a formal, explicit specification of a shared conceptualization. The basic thing is, you have something we call conceptualization, which is the world of ideas, concepts, and so on and so forth. Okay? And now you want to give some kind of formal uh, prospect to it, formal shape. Okay? So you go to the ontology. Right. But the thing is, how much formal? And why? How much formal? This is one of the first fights in ontologies. Because we can be as formal as we want. We can start by simple catalogs. Okay? Uh, uh, going towards something that you use a string matching 
But then you can have, for example, a controlled vocabulary, like a glossary. The thing I show with you can be seen as a controlled vocabulary. And then... Só que horas começa a aula? Então, ainda, essa aula aqui começou às quatro. Ok, so, uh, there is a famous paper, this is a good paper, which, is, which tells that uh, ontology is not simple to define, ok? Because people use the term in several levels of formality. And I will show you more details about ontologies and show you that you can go from one edge to the other edge and you can even uh, improve the semantics. But there is something important when we talk about ontologies on the semantic web which is the semantics must be explicit okay and what is this explicit semantics this is a key word explicit semantics you will be the subject of the next class okay explicit semantics how we get the graph and put the semantics in an explicit way okay so i i in the next i will finish now and the next class